Chapter 18 He was lucky, that's what the doctor said when Jeff went in on Thursday. Five weeks, and he could be back on active duty, good as new. Another week, and he would be able to go back on light duty, and although the doctor went on to explain how easily the damage to his hands could have been much worse, Jeff still didn't feel all that lucky. Numb was a better word for it. Tired and numb. When he crawled behind the wheel of the GTO, a thousand memories were there waiting for him. None of them were good, and none of them understood that he just wanted to be left alone. As he drove down the streets, he thought about going by to see her, but he knew how overwhelmed she must be with all the work that would have piled up in her absence. That was part of it. The other part of it was that he hated the pity in her eyes. He hated when she hesitated, trying to find the right words so he wouldn't be reminded. It didn't matter. The reminders were everywhere. In fact, they were attached to his own body. How much more reminder did he need? Thoughts swirled inside him until he was surprised his brain didn't just shut down from the overload. He needed something, someone to talk to. Angling his car off the freeway, he turned up the station street. Days and shifts crisscrossed in his brain so that he had no idea who would be there when he walked in. Anyone, anyone who understood would be a blessing. The trucks sat on the driveway pad, the water dripping along the sides as Jeff walked up the sidewalk toward them. Heads up, the voice yelled from the other side of the truck, and Jeff smiled as the sponge hit the bucket of suds, sending a fountain of them into the air. You know, you're going to have to show me how you do that sometime, Jeff called. Instantly, Dante's head appeared at the top of the truck. Jeff, what in the world are you doing here? Jeff shrugged. Where else am I supposed to be? With one leap, Dante was on the ground. You're injured, boy. Injured. That means you can stay at home and watch soap operas all day and eat bonbons if you want to. Bonbons, huh? Are they any good? I wouldn't know. I've never gotten the chance to try them. You, on the other hand, have a perfectly good excuse. And what do you do? Come here. Now, tell me, in what realm does that make sense? Taylor, Captain Hayes said, emerging from the dark station. What brings you by? Jeff held out his hand, which the captain shook very carefully. I was hoping Captain Rainier would be in. I wasn't sure what shift it was today. Sea shift today, but Rainier's upstairs anyway. Paperwork, you know. Come on. The clock couldn't go fast enough for Lisa. At 4.42, she could have sworn it had actually stopped. It wasn't until she watched it for a full two minutes before she decided it hadn't. The Chronicle ads came out today, Sherry said, walking in as Lisa stared at the clock. They turned out pretty good. She laid them on the desk. Huh. Did you know that if you look at it real closely, that clock hand looks like it's bent? But bent Sherry asked, glancing back at the clock. No, can't say I've ever noticed that. And that little peggy thing in the middle. How do they get it so that it holds the hands where they're supposed to be, but still lets them move? I wouldn't know. Hmm, somebody should look into that. Surely there's a grant out there for something like that, wouldn't you think? Sherry's blank look and utter silence brought Lisa back. What? Nothing. Sherry stood there for one more moment and then pointed at the desk in front of Lisa. The Chronicle. Lisa nodded and looked down dutifully, although she never saw anything. Life itself was a blur of worry and fear. When she looked up again, Sherry was gone, and Lisa thought it was probably for the best. She couldn't hit Rational with a two-foot pitch. The clock tugged her gaze back to it, and she stood in surrender. He would need supper. Taking a shower with only elbows was one of the hardest things Jeff had ever tried to do. How he had managed to accomplish it prior to this, he was sure was a question only the haze surrounding him at that time could answer. The plastic bags and rubber bands covering his hands helped, but not nearly enough. His fingers felt like immovable sticks, 
and pressure on the palms felt like a million tiny needles jabbing into every nerve ending. He couldn't hold the soap, it ended up on the floor, and the little bit of shampoo he managed to get out seemed to go everywhere other than his hair. It was the epitome of frustration. Finally, he leaned an elbow against the faucet to shut off the water. That would have to be good enough. Another week in these infuriating bandages would be a real test of his aggravation tolerance. He pulled on sweatpants over his boxers. Jeans were out. A t-shirt would have to work too. Buttons and zippers were enough to make a monk curse. When he stepped to the bathroom mirror and worked the sink drawer open carefully, the top edges of his fingers delicately worked the comb upward. This had always seemed so easy before. Everything had seemed so easy before. Halfway to his head, the comb slipped from his grasp and bounced across the floor. With a frustrated kick, he sent it crashing into the cabinet. What had he done to deserve this? Any of this? He heard the knock out front, but it, like the phone, would have to get itself. Doorknobs were now the bane of his existence. Come in, he called angrily as he trekked through the living room. Three brown bags of groceries in hand, Lisa walked in. Don't ever go grocery shopping at five o'clock. It's a madhouse. When should you go? he asked, bewildered by her entrance. Midnight. It's much saner. She set the bags on the counter and started unloading them. Watching her, he leaned on the cabinet. I didn't know you were coming tonight. Incredulously, she looked at him. Of course I was coming. Didn't I tell you that? Not that I remember. Well, who did you think was going to change your bandages? He glanced down at his hands, now free of the plastic bags. I hadn't really thought about it. Well, it's a good thing one of us did. We don't want those things around any longer than they have to be. She put three things in the cabinets. So, what'd the doctor say? Oh, he said I was lucky. Next week, I can go back to light duty, Jeff said, as if that was the most natural news in the world. The whirlwind of action around her slowed. Next week? It's a good thing, too, he continued, oblivious to her unspoken concern. Sitting around here is going to make me nuts in like ten seconds. Her motion resumed, although not nearly as fast as it was before. I went to the station today. Dante was washing the truck. He's insane. Barely moving, she put the cheese in the refrigerator. I didn't know you were going back in today. He shrugged. I didn't have anywhere else to go. For a moment, there was only the sound of the last two things in the bag being put away as he struggled to find a topic. So, how was work? It was there. Problems and more problems. Same old thing. Liver? she asked, holding up a small plastic container. Whatever. I think I'm going to sit on the couch and put my hands up a little. The doctor said I'm supposed to. Okay, she said, nodding. When Jeff walked out of the kitchen, it was all Lisa could do to keep the exhale quiet. He didn't need to know how hard this was for her, how her stomach turned when she worked to redress the swollen red and purple wounds, how every small gasp of pain he sucked in went right through her like a knife, how tired she was from sleepless nights spent worrying about him and about Eve. She had tried to call Eve earlier in the day, but she wasn't home. Lisa wished she knew the number for Eve's parents. Somehow, she thought after the funeral, Eve would have ceased the camp out at her parents' house. But apparently, that hadn't happened yet. Not that Lisa blamed her. She just would have liked to know Eve was okay. Trying not to think about what the raw liver looked like, she used a dish towel to cover it while she cut it into thin strips. Meat. Good red meat. Food to make him strong again. Food to help his body to heal. She only wished there was a food that could make the slices in her soul heal as easily. Jeff noticed the small chunks of meat in the gravy. He noticed that even he could pick them up. The plastic glass she had put his water in had ridges in all the right places so it wouldn't slip from his bandages. 
He wondered how much she had thought about those things and how many were mere coincidences, but he didn't ask. Asking would ensure a conversation that he wasn't ready to have. So, what little they talked, he focused on telling her about all the things the guys were doing at the station during his visit and how he couldn't wait to get back there, back to life. A life that didn't involve sitting around with his hands above his head for hours. A life where he didn't even think about the difficulty of picking up a comb or a simple glass of water. A life where he could choose what to eat by what he was hungry for rather than by what he could conceivably get out without making a total mess. This is really good, he said as the food on his plate disappeared. Her fork pushed one mound of liver around. You sound surprised. No, not surprised, really. Then he caught himself. Well, a little. I thought takeout was more your style. She shook her head. Too much grease. You don't need that, right now. Her face beat that comment back. So, what did you do for lunch today? He pushed his plate over so she could put more liver gravy on it. Some little TV dinner thing I found in the back of the freezer. It was Chinese food, I think. You she asked, stopping in mid-scoop and not even being able to get the last word out. She took a breath. I'll make you something tonight, for breakfast tomorrow and lunch. What would you like? For breakfast? Yeah. He raised his eyebrows. How would I know that now? Because I'm going to make something for you now, and making it without knowing what I'm making is going to be rather difficult. So, what do you want for breakfast? He wished he knew, if for no other reason than to calm the frustration in her voice. How about a bacon sandwich? Good, then I'll make a bacon sandwich. They were like two robots getting through one task just to get to the next. After supper, Lisa did the dishes, made his bacon sandwich, and put the leftovers from supper on a plate draped with plastic. The fewer fine motor skills he had to use, the better. Then she walked into the living room. You ready to change those? Do I have a choice? He asked, not fully kidding. No, but I thought I'd ask anyway. She walked over to the couch. Come on, let's get this over with. That night, as he lay in bed alone, looking up at the ceiling, his thoughts drifted over her. For one brief moment in time, she had let the business side of her down to reveal the woman underneath. Now the business side was back in full force. Even when she kissed him goodnight, it was more about her duty than her desire. He felt it, and he wondered if she did too. On Friday, Murphy's Law kicked into full force in Lisa's life. There were the ads that said Cayman instead of Camden. There was the whole, I think my computer's got a virus thing from Sherry, which took a full two hours to fix. Then there was the call from Tucker, who Lisa simply didn't have the patience to deal with any more. Why do you keep calling me? she asked furiously as the end of her rope sailed away somewhere high above her. I thought you had decided. I told you I'd call you back, Tucker said uncomprehendingly. That we'd talk, don't you remember? She couldn't remember anything before she'd heard the words, Jeff is in the hospital. Everything before and since was a solid blur. I tried to call, but Sherry kept saying you were out. I thought you were avoiding me. The sigh escaped her before she knew it was there. I was out of the office the first part of the week. Out? On vacation? Funeral, she said levelly. Oh, I'm sorry. Like water seeping from a barely opened drain, She felt the energy ooze from her body. So you haven't done any more on the leadership conference then? No, it was all she could muster. Good, because I talked to Grandpa and we've decided we want to include some of our own factory workers and supervisors. You know, get them in the game too. In the game, she had never felt more out of the game. I can give you their names if you want, Tucker said. I don't have time to meet with you. No, I mean now. You got a pen? Somehow she took down the names, but it would be a miracle if any of them were right or even legible. 
When Tucker finished the list, he signed off, and Lisa was left holding the phone. Tired, pulled on her eyelids. Slowly, the desk took her head, and she was asleep before her body could protest. Except for the ache in the muscles of his forearms, Jeff was beginning to get used to the hassle of using everything other than his hands to do things. He had learned to open cabinet doors with his elbows, to open chip bags with his teeth, and that feet were good for a lot of things he had never noticed they would be useful for. However, when he tried to start supper, the limits of his improvisational abilities ran out. By the time he gave up, a jar of pickles lay in pieces on the floor by the refrigerator, and half the carton of milk was spilled all over the counter. The tuna can was open, but upside down under the can opener, and every time he stepped, he trod on another fork or spoon he had dropped. A few he had managed to get back up to the cabinet with his toes, but the others were now one interminable web of stainless steel booby traps. Hi, Lisa called when Jeff was in his room doing sit-ups next to the bed. If he couldn't be useful, he could at least work off his frustration. Jeff? Yeah, he called. I'm back here. 81, 82. What's up with the kitchen? she asked, surveying him carefully when she made it to the door of his room. Tuna sandwiches and soup, he said, pulling himself forward. I thought that sounded good for supper. Uh Uh-huh she said with a nod. Then she shrugged and arched her neck one way, squeezing her eyes closed at the pain that caused. Okay, well, I'll be in here when you're finished. Okay, he said. Ninety-three, ninety-four. When she turned down the hall, it occurred to him how slow her steps had become, and a vague concern for her traced through him. At one hundred and ten, he pulled the towel off the weight bench and threw it over his shoulder before walking to the kitchen. He found her bent over the shards of glass at the refrigerator. Those pickles had a mind of their own, he said timidly. Yeah, it looks that way. He waited a beat. How was work? Work, she said, dumping a handful of glass into the trash can. Have they come up with the office supply ads yet? I don't know. I was working on other things. Like what? Like, I don't know, other things. Oh, he said quietly. He paused a beat, trying to decide if he should venture into the next subject that came to mind. Gabe came by today. That's nice. With a little hand sweeper, she worked to corral the last little green shards cowering under the counter. He said they've got a new truck coming in next week, a brand new one. They're going to trade the old one down to one of the suburbs. That's nice. I wonder how different this new truck is going to be, you know, if we're going to have to retrain for it or anything. With a clang and three thumps on the trash can with the dustpan, Lisa stood and wiped her hands. She closed the trash can, put it back in the corner, and stepped over to the counter where she ran water on a dish rag and started wiping up the milk. Hayes must have some pull, though, to get a new truck. That other one's only eight or ten years old. The milk clean? She stepped over to the other cabinet and picked up the tuna can. How about tuna casserole, seeing as how we don't have any more pickles? He shrugged. Okay by me. Gently, he wiped his forehead with a towel. I really can't wait to get these bandages off next week. This itching thing is starting to make me nuts. Your hands? She asked with concern. No, everything else. Do you know how hard it is to itch your nose with these things? He held both hands up in testimony. It's annoying. I can imagine, she said softly as she dumped the contents of first one can and then another into the pan. His nose slipped from his consciousness as he really looked at her. Are you okay? I called Eve today, Lisa said, although her back was to him. You did? To make sure she's okay. Is she? Guilt slid over him for not thinking to make that call himself. She's trying to be, Lisa said, but her voice didn't make it all the way through the statement. Gently, he walked over to her and laid a hand on her shoulder. In the next heartbeat, she spun into him and crushed her eyelids into his chest. I can't imagine what she's going through right now. I can't even imagine it. Something told him as he held her, 
that she could come closer to imagining it than most of the other people on the planet. On Saturday, they went to see Eve. Lisa drove, although they took his car, so talking on the way was out. She needed too much brain power to work the car. That was good, though. In her books, the less they talked right now, the better. At the little townhouse, Lisa tried not to imagine them moving in, decorating, dancing in the kitchen, but it was difficult. Everywhere she looked, she saw not only Eve, but Dustin, too. Jeff was right. They were inseparable. So, how are you doing? Jeff asked when they sat down in the living room, which opened high above them into the bedrooms upstairs. Surviving, Eve said softly. How about you? I've been better. How are the hands? Bandages come off in a week. And then? Light duty only for four weeks, he said with a nod. At least that will give me something to do. Next to him, Lisa shifted on the couch, reaching for a change of subject. How are your parents? Adjusting. I think if they could, they'd put me in this little box and bubble wrap me, you know? But I'm just trying to get to the next minute in one piece. Has the station called? Jeff asked. They've been great, really supportive. One of the guys even brought the things over so I wouldn't have to go down there. For that, Lisa was thankful, standing by Jeff's locker traced through her, but she pushed that away. So do you think you're going to stay here then? Eve, thinner even than Lisa remembered, sat wordless for a long moment. I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead yet. I go back to work on Monday, and then I guess I'll see where life takes me from there. Right now, there's no big plan. Eve's gaze fell to her hands. Not anymore, anyway. The fight against the tears was obvious in her voice, and when she looked up, they were glittering on her lashes. I'm sorry. Lisa's own resolve buckled as she watched Jeff stand and cross the two feet to envelop Eve in his arms. Hey, hey, don't ever apologize to us, he said as he held her. If you need to cry, then that's what you need to do, and that's okay. Eve sniffed. It's just that we always knew this was a possibility, you know? We always did. I just somehow never thought it would be us. No one does, Jeff said as he held her. No one does. She sniffed again. I feel like such a burden on everyone, like they all have to stop what they're doing to take care of me. Hey, you're not a burden. Besides, that's the point of this life, being there for each other. If we didn't have that, what would there be to live for? He hugged her and then pulled away to look at her face. This thing is on your timetable. As long as it takes, we'll be here, okay? Slowly she nodded. Don't ever forget that. The whole next week, Lisa tried to keep that comment in her heart, as long as it took. That's how long she wanted to be there for him, and she was determined not to let him forget it. So, when they were seated at the table over pasta the next Friday, it was all she could do to squelch the terror when he made his announcement. I'm going to start hazmat classes in September, he said, as if he was telling her he'd picked up the dry cleaning. The noodle slipped down the wrong pipe in her throat, and Lisa choked on it. Hazmat? Yeah. Hazardous materials. I didn't get my certification when I got out because it was going to take too long, but I really think it would be a step in the right direction now. Besides, if I take it in September, I can take aircraft rescue in October and be fully certified by November. She swallowed the protests with the drink she took. But your hands... The doctor said it shouldn't be any problem by September. Besides, if I get these two certificates, then I can start working my way up the ladder to driver, and then to lieutenant. Her gaze wouldn't leave the table. I didn't know you wanted to work up the ladder. Of course I do, he said with a small laugh. Doesn't everybody? Well, yeah, I guess. When do you start? They were the hardest four words she had ever spoken, followed instantly by the two hardest she had ever heard. September 2nd. 
Lisa couldn't get that date out of her head. While she redressed the wounds that were looking far too good for her sanity, while she sat next to him on the couch watching some movie she didn't really care about, while she stood on his threshold saying good night and wondering how many more good nights they would have. In her dreams, Eve was there constantly saying how she had never thought it would be them, and Jeff was there sitting next to her in that graveyard, and she was there clutching a flag and screaming at God above for one more moment with him. In the daylight, she held her world together by the barest of threads, hoping against hope that he would change his mind and end her nightmares. It was this side of impossible to hear him sound excited about going back to work. She hated that job, the station, and everything associated with it. If she could just find a way to tell him that, make him see that it was killing her to think of him walking into another fire, that her heart seared at the center just thinking about it. If she could just do that, then her world could get back to normal. If she couldn't, she was vaguely aware that nothing would ever be right again. This has been To Protect and Serve, Volume 1 of the Courage series. Written by Stacey Stallings. Narrated by Becky Dowdy. Copyright 2012 by Stacey Stallings. Production Copyright 2014 by Stacey Stallings. This has been a Braveheart Audiobooks production. You don't want to miss what comes next. Like and subscribe to the Stacy Stallings YouTube channel so you never miss a second of the story.